There we go. This is lesson three, manifestations of the fleshless or pre-incarnate logos, the son as creator. First and foremost, let's ask some questions, some basic questions before we go any further. How, how did God appear to the righteous? As it says very clearly, he appeared to the righteous in the Old Testament. How did he appear? We have St. Justin Martyr, among others, who are going to help us answer this question tonight. God, in as it says in the, uh, the Apostle's beautiful uh, epistle, God in sundry times and diverse manners appeared to the righteous, the patriarchs, the prophets, and conversed with them. But how did the invisible and bodiless God appear? And how did they see him, who no one has ever seen? And yet in the Old Testament, we see the presence of God is very much felt and his appearances are quite frequent. In what way then does God appear and who is this God who is appearing? Holy Fathers make it very clear that he who from the outset of creation until the incarnation was appearing was the still as yet still fleshless son that is operating by the com common trinal or triune or trinitarian energies. All right. So that is, he was the son, still fleshless, the pre incarnate logos, operating by the common triunal energies. They have, they, have, they have common energies between the three persons. Jesus was he who appeared, St. Justin Martyr says, and spoke to Moses and Abraham and the other patriarchs, carrying out the will of the Father. This is one and the same. Now we have an incarnate Logos, Jesus Christ, the pre-incarnate Logos, appearing to the old the righteous of old. The pre-existing Son and Logos speaks and acts in the the theophanies. Now theophanies are another word for manifestations of God. It's an easier, quicker way to say manifestations of God uh, from the Greek, theophanies. We also say the Feast of Theophany, but this is many uh, such manifestations. And he speaks and acts in the Theophanies and more generally in the Old Testament in such a way as to be considered a foretelling of his incarnation. The one in the same, one and the same, I should say, God appears both in the Old and New Testaments. And he is the Son and Logos of God. The forefathers are men of Christ, and they saw him in human form which he was destined to assume during his incarnation. So it's very important. If you're paying attention, the implications and the consequences are great. Now, he's not fleshing all these implications and consequences out, but some of us should be able to pick up them very quickly. If Christ was, if they were the forefathers of the Old Testament, were men of Christ, and they saw him in human form, right? They saw him in the form that he was destined to take, it says. Or in, other, or in other forms, because there are many forms that he came to in the Old Testament. If he is the one and the same that became incarnate, obviously then the Old Testament, the prophets, do not belong to Judaism, which has rejected the Logos incarnate, or Islam, which never accepted the Logos incarnate and considers him to be a mere prophet, a man, such that they are Arians uh, in, in that sense. So what is this talk today of the religions of the book or the common God between the various religions? It's absolutely illiterate from a patristic standpoint. God forbid any of you or any Orthodox Christians would entertain the idea that somehow we share in common the prophets and the righteous of the Old Testament with the religions which have rejected him who they saw and communed with. Not possible. And equally so, anyone who rejects the Old Testament on the other extreme is also rejecting the incarnate Logos. So this, the fleshless Logos, they saw and with him they spoke, all of those who were made worthy of the theophanies in the Old Testament. For neither Abraham, this is St. Justin Martyr again, neither Abraham, nor Isaac, nor Jacob, nor any other man saw the Father and ineffable Lord of all, 
but saw his son and the angel, the angel of great counsel we'll talk about, who according to the good pleasure of God willed to be born a man from the virgin. Just a note for those of you who read this text, uh, I initially was using a translation from the uh, New Advent, I think it is, Roman Catholic page where they have a lot of patristic texts, but I noticed the inconsistency of the translation, so I had to retranslate it. So just so you know. And so we're talking here about the Logos, the angel of great counsel, being he who spoke and saw, and and uh, or they saw rather, and he spoke with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the righteous, and not God, the Father, of course. And why is that? Why is it? We'll talk about that in a minute. It is the traditional stance of patristic interpretation that the logos of God, the word of God, and this is the typical way we say it in English. We use it interchangeably in this book's translation because it's important for the word word does not totally capture logos in Greek because it also has to do with the reason. So it's not just the word. And so we've stuck mostly to the word logos, kept the Greek for that purpose because we feel like word is not sufficient to describe the Greek. So again, it is the traditional stance of patristic interpretation that the Logos of God reveals himself continually and in various ways throughout the entire Old Testament. This is George, Father George Florovsky being quoted. His self-revelation, however, is characterized by ambigu ambiguity and a secrecy for the following reason. The Son of God, this is quoting St. John Chrysostom, the Son of God appeared to the Jews with the prophets, not unambiguously and clearly, but, as it were, in the shadows and sporadically. For the Jews had only recently been freed from the delusion of poly, polytheism, and if they had once again heard of God the Father and God the Logos, they would have returned to the same illness, polytheism. Or polytheism. This is why the prophets continuously repeated that there is one God, and beside him there is no other, without this meaning, of course, that they deny the existence of the Son. Rather, they were trying to heal their sickness and to finally be convinced to let go of the idea that there were many gods. So that explains what seems to be a certain secrecy, ambiguity, hiddenness in the shadows. Uh, not the clarity that we're used to, what we see, of course, after the incarnation. And yet, there are many clear signs and, and manifestations. In spite of that, uh, that pedagogical need to bring the the, the ever uh, inclining Jews toward idolatry back again and again to the one God. So again, how did he appear, and how did they see him? All of the theophanies were by condescension. He emptied himself in his, and became a man, but also in the Old Testament, he condescended to their weaknesses, of course. For no one saw the essence of God, for God is without form. Each of the prophets, however, saw him in a different form, not in his essence, St. John Chrysostom. They saw him in a visible and sensible form. And they heard his voice analogous with their disposition and their virtue. In Holy Scripture, God is given a form analogous with the disposition of those to whom he is appearing. And that is why he is called by a myriad of names without, however, being any one of them. So it's very fascinating. I hope that we might want to read that again. It's very important. So we see to re to re let's say, state what's been stated here by the saints, we see <clears throat> that they saw him in a visible and sensible form. And they heard his voice depending on their disposition, depending on their virtue. And there were many different, different forms because there are many different dispositions and levels of virtue. None of that revealed, of course, the essence. All of that was in the realm of condescension. And therefore, we must not confuse these, obviously, with the final and ultimate revelation, clear revelation of Jesus Christ in the incarnation. They are types and forms that 
are pointing, showing forth, communing, communicating with the righteous, but not, of course, to the degree of the incarnation. So God the Logos, wanting to communicate with his elect, his elect instruments, the organa, the, uh, is the Greek term, organa. So you could say organs, but I think instruments is what's usually cho chosen, the instruments of God. He was an instrument in the hand of God, the elect. And to impart his message condescended and appeared in a different way to each prophet. Not exactly as he was, but rather he became like unto that which those who saw him could see. He condescended to their weaknesses and limitations. At times they saw him sitting, and other times they were, they saw him armed for war. Oplismeni is the Greek word, so as close as we can get to Oplismeni, could be armed simply, but I think it's a bit strange just to say armed, that he you know, have a knife in his hand, it's a bit strange. But in any case, armed for war, still other times to have white hair, the ancient of days, or the form of wind, the prophet Elias, or in the form of fire, or being carried by the cherubim and his visage depicted as brightly shining, adapting his manifestations according to each circumstance. Again, St. John Chrysostom. So he adapted his manifestations accordingly to our weakness. Very, uh, very good so far. And that which they saw was not the essence of God, which is invisible and imparticipable. There's no way we can participate. There's no methixy is the Greek term. There's no methixy. There's no uh, participation in the essence of God. This is one of the grave problems in some philosophical and Western ideas uh, that they cannot distinguish between essence and energies here. We'll talk, I'm sure, a lot about this going forward. And therefore, they envision a essentially, ultimately, from the Orthodox perspective, a, a salvation which has no communication. There's no communion. There's no real communion in the uncreated energies because they cannot envision uh, the uncreated and the uh, that which is the, the essence of God. As in, in particular, it cannot be communed. And so, therefore, they think of a salvation which is essentially the undoing of the incarnation. The whole point of the incarnation is to bring us to a total and utter communion with God in his uncreated energy. So, yes, there is no uh, participation in the essence. There is, it is impossible, the essence of God, which is invisible, to be that which they saw. So what was it? It was the logos of God, still fleshless, who took bodily form appropriate for each, each instance. All of the, 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 the theophanies happened by way of condescension and were not visions of the true essence of God. For if they had seen the nature itself, they would not have seen it each time. They would have seen it. They would not have seen it each time in a different way. All right, so if they'd seen the essence, they would have seen the same thing. All the prophets would have had seen the same thing, but they didn't. They saw different things at different times. For the nature is simple, formless, and indescribable, and neither sits, it should not say I, it should say he or it, neither sits, nor stands, nor walks. All of these things belong to bodies. All right, so formless, indescribable, and, and, and simple, the nature, and therefore these are, this is not the nature itself that they were seeing, but manifestations forms that were taken for the sake of the communication of God and man in the Old Testament. St. John the Damascene now, the great teacher of the faith, the patriarchs and the prophets did not see the essence of God again, but the type and the image of the Son and Logos of God. We'll talk a lot about types in the next weeks ahead. Uh, we've got a whole section Probably, I'm looking at the table of contents here. We'll probably get to the types after one, two, three, four, five lessons. We'll start talking about types, symbols, and prefigurements in the Old Testament. But the type and the image of the Son and Logos of God, <clears throat> who was to become incarnate, 
He who, though invisible, became true man truly and appeared on earth. Before his incarnation, all those who saw his type and his image worshipped him. So they had true worship of and communication with God through the types, through the images they communicated. The theophanies were trinal or trinitarian manifestations. The fleshless logos was the bearer of the trinal or trinitarian energies. They're common to the Trinity. And thus the theophanies of the Logos were trinal manifestations, revelations. In other words, of the triune God through the fleshless Logos. Lest people say that the Trinity is not apparent in the Old Testament. You'll see how just apparent he is. And even, to, even we can say that the Logos, theophanies of the Logos, the many theophanies were necessarily trinitarian or trinal manifestations because of the common uh, energy listen to what he says here the holy father stressed emphatically that in the old testament all of the theophanies through the fleshless logos or pre-incarnate logos are christ-centered and therefore simultaneously trinity centered these are things that cannot be divided obviously the fleshless son appeared in various ways within a mystery, enshrouded as in a cloud, in order to protect his people from the delusion of polytheism. For it was impossible for the Trinitarian nature of persons in one divinity to be understood by a people, a nomadic people, spiritually illiterate and infantile as the Israelite people were at that time. All right, so here we have a condescension for, to appear. We now have a condescension for the sake of this people who were spiritually illiterate in infantile, which is apparent if one reads the story of the, the, the books of Genesis or Exodus, how they inclined again and again toward, toward uh, idolatry. Uh, so it was necessary for this to be enshrouded in a, as in, in a cloud because of their weakness. The incarnate son will reveal most clearly the mystery of the true Ayun God with his incarnation. As it says in John 1, 7, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, whereas the law was given by Moses as a barrier, pragmos is the Greek term, which could be translated as wall or barrier or fortification uh, but i think it's something that ultimately is a barrier because it does not allow them to commune and to see face to face so as a barrier and as a preparation so that's all it was so those those christians who have returned to a kind of moralism characteristic of the pre-incarnate logos are the most tragic Reducing Christianity to a moralism or a legalism is indeed to reverse the whole process of the economy of salvation and to go back before the incarnation. It's to empty the life in Christ out of all grace and truth. It's a tragedy, a grave tragedy. So grace came through Jesus Christ. The law was given through Moses and that was simply a preparation for the Lord and his incarnation. Christ, as seen, is seen, and you see the image here from one of the domes in a church in Greece, of Christ, the angel of great counsel. Very important here, because unfortunately there are some, even saints in the West, who did not understand this who do not understand that he is the angel of great counsel. He is the pre-incarnate logos that is appearing to everyone in the Old Testament. There were, unfortunately, Christian teachers and theologians who did not understand this, apparently. All of the theophanies in the Old Testament are referring to the Son and the Logos. Quote from Father John Romanides. For those ancient theologians the fathers of the ecumenical councils, for the entire Orthodox tradition, 
The Logos of the New Testament is the Lord of the Old Testament, the Lord of glory of the Old Testament. The ancient church identified Christ with the angel of great counsel and wisdom of God, Sophia to Theo. By the way, the Hagia Sophia of Constantinople is dedicated to this wisdom of God, to Christ himself. And it celebrates its feast day on and mid Pentecost, and it's a, it's a head scratcher that there were theologians at the beginning of the 20th century among the Orthodox who somehow wanted to see in the wisdom of God something else besides Christ and give it a feminine uh, nature or aspect. Unbelievable, but true. It's always been understood that the wisdom of God is Christ Himself, and the angel of good counsel. The same, one and the same. And thus we can say that the Old Testament is Christ-centered. If Adam, Abraham, and Moses had heard the voice of God the Father and seen him, the Savior would not have said about his father, you have never heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. That's John 5, 37. The Lord says about the Father, ye have never seen, heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. Think about that. The consequences are major. So Adam, Abraham, Moses did not hear the voice of God the Father. What did they hear? It is apparent that no one has ever heard the voice of the Father and that all revelations happened through the Son, the Word of God. Through him and in him all the revelations happened. In, in here we're talking about the Old Testament. So you have never heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. So this is the Logos in the Old Testament. The, this is the angel of great counsel, the Lord himself. And you can see the Jesus Christos, the ICX on the side right and, and left, and the cross behind his head. And yet he's depicted as the angel of great counsel. The church has always identified the Lord of glory, the angel of great counsel, the wisdom of God with the Logos. Sarx and Yenedo, the one who took flesh, all one and the same. So now we're going to turn and address the most, we're going to begin addressing the most important theophanies. This was an introduction to this whole section. This whole section will be addressing tonight, we're going to be looking at the Son as Creator, but next week we'll be looking at the hospitality and the sacrifice of Abraham. The following week we'll look at the revelations to Jacob, the burning yet unconsumed bush will follow. He that leads Israel out of Egypt, the God seer's quest for the face of God, the lawgiver, the vision of the prophet Isaiah, the ancient of days, he that preserved the youth, three youths in the furnace. These are all sections and uh, we'll be addressing in the weeks ahead. And other manifestations of the fleshless word. This is all in the section theophanies or manifestations of the fleshless word or logos pre-incarnate. Now, the first thing we're going to see is the son as creator and it's all based on the scriptures the father's the hymnography very important in the orthodox church the hymnography and also the uh iconographic tradition which we're using uh, profusely as you see right here this image of christ creating all of the animals but also adam himself christ as the creator of all of creation we'll talk about that right now Creation ex nihilo, nihilo, that's from nothing, that's the Latin. My son was particularly excited about us putting Latin on the page. He's a, as a, a lover of Latin. Creation ex nihilo is a humanly inconceivable idea. Let me take a little parenthesis here. This idea, which was adopted most certainly by the Church Fathers, tragically was criticized and rejected by contemporary theologians, in particular Philip Sherrard, in his book, Liniments of a, of a Sacred Tradition, Christianity, Liniments of a Sacred Tradition, which is, I think, in my perspective, influenced by perennialism. And it's interesting because here the fathers who wrote, who wrote this book are saying it's not conceivable. It's beyond conception. And so we have to crucify our intellect on this and not suppose that we can uh, take our rational analytical uh, 
ideas and and even if we're extremely graced with uh, that kind of powerful mind, it will not pierce this mystery. So those who try to pierce the mysteries oftentimes end up speaking falsehood. And so let's be on guard because that is a constant problem today. Lots of academic theologians are falling away from Christ because they cannot crucify their very powerful intellects on certain truths that do not fit into their logical uh, uh, presuppositions. Creation ex nihilo is a humanly inconceivable idea, which even the wise Greeks could not understand. They believed that creation was co-eternal with God. That is a utter heresy for the Orthodox. Holy Scripture, however, teaches that all things were made ex nihilo, from nothing, that by the creative hand of Almighty God. There is nothing, visible or invisible, material or spiritual, aside from God, which was not created from nothing. As St. Gregory Palma says, aside from God, nothing is uncreated. He's the only uncreated. Everything else is created. Angels, men, the whole of creation came out of non-existence, becoming works, creations, or deeds and creatures of the all-wise triune God. He spoke, and they came to be. He commanded, and they were created, it says in Scripture. So, very important foundational doctrinal uh, a doctrine of the church, without which you will have trouble, serious spiritual trouble, and fall into delusion. Creation by the Trinity, with the one will, one power, and one energy. One will, one power, and one energy common to the Trinity. So the Father, through the Son, in the Holy Spirit, creates all things with one will and one power and one energy. All things are done in a Trinitarian manner. The Son and the Spirit were, so to speak, the two hands with which God created the world and man, according to the Holy Scriptures. Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. It says, and by the word of the Lord were the heavens established, and all the might of them by the spirit of his mouth. All three persons of the Holy Trinity create, since the triunal energy is one and shared. Is only the Father or also the Son creator of the things that were made? Of course, it is also the Son and the Holy Spirit. And all were all, and we are all creatures, not only of the Father, but also of the only begotten Son and the Holy Spirit. So the Trinity is the creator. And it's clear right here in Scripture. Listen to what it says. Although God created all things only by his command, when he created man, he said, let us make. Let us make. It says here in the icon, if you can't see it, let us make man in our image after our likeness. That's what scripture says. Who's us? The Holy Trinity. So he said, let us make so as to show his first co-worker, thus revealing the divinity of the Son. Who, where are those naysayers who say that the Son does not appear in the Holy Scripture? When saying let us in the in the Old Testament, I mean, when saying let us make, God is speaking with the co-worker of creation, the Son, by whom also he made the worlds, and with the Holy Spirit as well. The let us make is the first revelation of the Holy Trinity, right there in the beginning when they're creating Adam and eventually Eve from Adam. The Son is co-creator with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Referring to the let us make, the Holy Chrysostom asks, with whom is God conversing? And he gives the following answer. It is abundantly clear that he is conversing with his only begotten Son. He did not say make, lest you consider it a slavish command, but rather let us make, let us make. So that by the form of these words, which indicate consultation, he might show the equality of honor. Of course, in his day, but in our day as well, there are many, many who deny the divinity of Christ, the, the 
and the equal honor of the logos with the father, the Arians and others. So in our day, how many are there? Jehovah's Witness uh, and the Muslims and literally hundreds and hundreds of millions of people who are functionally Arians, whether they know it or not. The Son, therefore, is co-creator with the Father and the Spirit. And as it pertains to the dignity of the creation, he does not at all fall short of the Father. So with regard to the creation, of course, he is co-creating and does not fall short of his honor in that. So it is the Son and the Holy Spirit and not the angels or himself that God the Father is addressing at the creation of man. This is one of the ideas that are floated by atheists or Protestants, unfortunately, that he's not talking to the Son and the Holy Spirit. He's talking to some angel. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's utterly absurd that academics of the 21st century can speculate in such a way and suppose that the creation story, as many do, is not a revelation to Moses. They suppose that it's oral tradition coming down. Have they ever thought that there was no one at the creation of the world? So what is this oral tradition that is coming down? There must obviously have been a revelation of the things of, of, of that time, beginning of creation. It's not possible for there not to have been a revelation of this. Otherwise, they're implying, and this would be an atheist kind of approach, if they call themselves Christians, they're not. They're implying that this is a man-made, man-centered, speculative mythology that is uh, that is being presented here. Clearly, that is delusional and heretical from the Christian standpoint. So they're not Christians who push this idea. And yet you hear this in the halls of academia among so-called Christians, that it was not a revelation to Moses, that Moses was not the God seer and saw how uh, creation took place and recorded it through God's word to him. This is what the church has said and taught for 2,000 years. So again, it is the Son and the Holy Spirit and not the angels, or he's not himself talking to himself, or the Father talking to himself, absurd, that God the Father is addressing the creation of man. He enigmatically declared the identity of the essence and the number of the persons. That is, by saying God said, he made clear the common nature and by adding, let us make, he revealed the number of the persons. So right there is the Trinitarian theology already in, you know, for, in the form. And then we have it confirmed again and again, of course, with the revelation of Jesus Christ. He revealed the number of the persons. Again, by saying in the image, he showed the identity of the nature. By, our, by adding R, he indicated the number of the hypostases. This is St. Photius the Great talking. We're quoting St. Photius the Great. You see the icon on the left there at the top. And St. Gregory Palamas icon below him. And he will be quoted right now. He indicated the number of the hypostases, he says. This is uh, St. Photius. And then he says, in the creation of man, the Holy Spirit is revealed as well. By saying he breathed into he reveals the hypothesis of the Holy Spirit, according to St. Gregory Palamas. And there's much, much more we can say about that, but we're not we're going to get on a tangent if we start there. Christ is the fashioner of man, and the church has always seen it. Look at this icon, the Russian icon, showing the angel of the Greek council. Christ himself, the I-C-I-X-C, Jesus Christos, left and right. He has the... Um, Halo, uh, the particular halo showing uh, the pre-incarnate logos there. And so Christ is the fashioner of man, of course, with the Holy Trinity, but he is the fashioner. Christ was the one who from the beginning fashioned the body of Adam from the ground. It was Christ. For he is the wisdom and word and power of the Father. It is God the Word who brought all things from non-existence into being by His Word alone. His Word alone, all things came from non-existence into being. Again, so much for all of the atheist systems and all the pushback on the uh, logos and creation. By His Word, He is uh, the wisdom, Word, and power of God. And therefore, 
It is God, the word, who brought all things from non-existence into being by his word alone. He it is that established the earth upon the waters. He it is that created the entire visible and noetic world in wisdom. He it is that fashioned and formed man out of the clay by hands, not made by hands. Listen to that. Isn't that beautiful? This is St. Cyril of Jerusalem. He says, he it is that fashioned and formed man out of the clay by hands, not made by hands. His hands, which were not made by hands. He's the one who fashioned and formed man out of the clay. And who now became a man himself. He made it according to the prototype himself. He, the Son and Word of God, was indeed also the true cultivator of paradise, according to St. Theophylact of the Bulgarian. He was the true cultivator of paradise. We're going to talk about paradise here in a moment. Let's talk about creation of Adam and Eve. Christ was the one who walked in paradise, but the first formed. We we'll read about that. In the book of Genesis, the Lord and God, who was conversing with the first formed. The sound of whose footsteps they heard when he walked in paradise is none other than the only begotten son. As our church chants in the well-known Troparian of Cassiani on Holy Wednesday. Do you remember last week when we talked about how it, we said that this is a form he takes it's, and this is him talking to Adam, right? We talked about this last week. We talked about it's not the essence of God. It's not the invisible God. But And so, but he, he this is the Lord, the Logos, taking the form and putting it in the mind, as it were, of Adam, walking in the cool of the day, as it says. And listen to the Chaparian now, which is known to all Orthodox Christians who have ever attended the services of Holy Week, because on Tuesday of Holy Week, we chant this most beautiful hymn. This is an excerpt. And what does she say there, the great hymnographer? I will kiss thine immaculate feet, and whose sound Eve hid herself for fear when she heard thee walking in paradise in the cool of the day. He who was speaking with Adam before God in paradise was his word. For the divine scripture teaches us that Adam said that he heard the voice of God. The voice is nothing other than the God, the word of God, who is also his son. So the word that Adam heard was the Logos, the word of God himself, St. Theophilus of Antioch. Now, unfortunately, as this whole adventure of our reality began with the listening of the serpent and the departure from paradise, it's the Lord himself who put the sword guarding paradise and set the cherubim as guardians of paradise. The Holy Chrysostom, St. John Chrysostom, writes that it was the Son and Word that placed the flaming sword to guard paradise for all of Adam's descendants. St. John Damascene also expresses the same view in hymns. Against him that fell, thou didst set the cherubim as guardians of the tree of life. And when they saw thee, they opened up the gates, for thou didst appear opening the way into paradise for the thief. He's talking about after the resurrection. This is from the Traparian, the first Traparian of the sixth ode on the canon of the cross and the resurrection, tone two, or Sunday. So he says, they did, thou didst set the cherubim's guardians, the sword, before the tree of life. It was thee, O Lord, who they opened up the gates for, when thou didst appear, going up, uh, into paradise with the thief. And so again and again, the church confesses that it is the Lord himself that is uh, appearing and talking and guiding the people of old. The father saw through the son, and this shows a united will. This is St. Basil the Great we're going to be quoting. All things were therefore made by the word. All things were made by the word. And without him was not anything made that was made. John 1.3, again, confessing that he is the creator with together with the Father and the, and the Spirit. By the common trinal energy and the common will. 
The fact that the Father creates through the Son neither renders the Father's creation imperfect nor reveals the energy of the Son to be weak, but instead, it should be instead, indicates the united will. All right, so this is a uh, an attempt on some heretics to say, well, therefore, uh, there's some kind of imperfection or some kind of weakness, but actually it's the opposite. It shows the perfect and united will of the Father and the Son uh, in the Holy Trinity. And who is this but the same one who shows us and during his incarnation that he is the creator of all things. And he shows us in the great miracle of the blind man's eyes. He, creator of the blind man's eyes is the creator of all. So the Lord himself showed us all of this theology in taking and healing the blind man who had no eyes to speak of. He did not heal existing eyes. There were no eyes. He put eyes into the man. He created them and put them into the man. And that's why he stooped down and put his hands in the mud and fashioned, just like he did with Adam to begin with. This is the Lord incarnate, telling us that he is the Logos, the pre-incarnate Logos speaking and uh, from the very beginning of creation. The, the, the text says, when the incarnate Son and Word was speaking of the creation of man, he mentioned neither the Father nor himself, but rather spoke impersonally and vaguely saying, he who created men or man. Because the, because the Jews did not accept the pre his preexistence and rejected his creative power. So he spoke impersonally for their sake. Desiring, St. John Chrysostom says, to show, it should be to show that he created the entire man, Christ left the one born blind incomplete. He had no eyes. And such that by coming and granting him his very eyes, and thus completing his formation, he would bring us to faith in him as the one who fashioned the whole man. This is the point of the miracles. People get carried away with miracles. The point of the whole miracles is to show the divinity of Christ, to show that he is God, and therefore to become his disciples and worship him. That's the end of everything. The eyes were returned so that those the man with those eyes could then follow and, and worship the Lord, and all of us as well can recognize his divinity. So this is a powerful witness in the New Testament to him being the very creator of all things. Who could have done that but the creator of all things? No man could have restored, obviously, the eyes that did not exist. So it's a tremendous witness to the theology that we're just presenting right now. By his words, St. John Chrysostom says, by his words, he was silent concerning the creator. But by his action, he taught that he is him who perfects bodily imperfections. So here he's saying, if we go back before, that he mentioned neither father nor himself. He spoke impersonally and vaguely, he who created men. So with his words, he was silent concerning the creator himself. But by his action, by his action, which is giving eyes to a blind man who did not have them from birth, by his action, he showed that he was the one who created everything and, and perfects creation, completes the creation, which was incomplete. So this is, all of these are great and tremendous witnesses, first of many such uh, witnesses that we will go through in this course, to the divinity of the the uh, the Lord, uh, the unity of the Trinity, the presence of the Logos in the Old Testament and and throughout with all the righteous, uh, that it, it is nothing less than the the angel of Greek Council and the wisdom of God that is speaking the same one and same who comes incarnate. The, all of this has to be identified. There's tremendous heretical teachings uh, that I I'm, I think we will eventually mention as we go forward that are countered by these foundational dogmatic understandings right once you have these you might not understand it right now you might say well okay so it's kind of theoretical it's kind of unconnected but if you acquire this knowledge and you you learn well the teachings of the fathers it'll become second as it were in in you to pull forward when you're talking to the various heresies and heretics 
and they have completely fallen away. Uh, for instance, Jehovah's Witness who deny that, that the Lord uh, of glory, the Yahweh is Jesus Christ. And they are, they are Arians for, for that sake. If you have Jehovah's Witness to come to your house and you want to be able to speak, you can now. If you understand the teachings of the church and the fathers, you can say, but this is the same Lord again and again. After this course and after these, just this next six weeks, you're going to be you're going to be armed spiritually with tremendous knowledge that will allow you to navigate the various heresies that are, are many in our day and have always been uh, in the history of the church. So tonight's lesson, so this is one of the things we're going to be dealing with, and it's very hard to plan. Tonight's lesson is a bit shorter than previous lessons because we have to stop at a certain section in the book, right? So we're, if we had gone on to the next section, and I had presented that tonight, which was going to be for next week, the uh, the uh, philoctonia, the hospitality of Abraham, and the uh, sacrifice of Abraham, and the appearances uh, of uh, uh, to to Jacob. Here we have this book book here. Uh, we would not we would not have been able to finish it within a lot of time, but because. The material is shorter. We present it more quickly. We can open it up now to questions, and we can begin questions. That's the end of this this particular lecture. Let's uh, let's open it up to questions and have a discussion about what we presented. Hopefully, these more uh, approachable bites of information will allow us to go deeper. It's going to be more patience on our part. We have to be more patient over a longer period of time. But if you get a little bit each time and you listen carefully and you consider and you go deeper and you look on your own and you bring that to the table, you're going to build this very uh, phenomenal uh, house of spiritual knowledge of, of our Lord, uh, which will be you know, impenetrable from the enemy. You will, not, you will be so uh, strengthened in, in your belief in his divinity and his the economy of salvation. Uh, that you'll become, in, in, you know, impenetrable by the, the the demons and their lies. So I really encourage you to to uh, you know be here every every Thursday uh, going forward, and 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 consider uh, deeply what we're talking about. Take screenshots. Of course, if you're if you're on our um, if you're on in the uh, various uh, platforms, you you'll be able to have the uh, PDF, it's made available to the various platforms. Um, maybe some are a little bit lo uh, later coming than others, but they are going to be uploaded everywhere and they're available uh, on the orthodoxitos.com website. We'll talk about that in the uh, question and answers tonight, but uh, even if you're, if you're not joining us for that, you can do some screenshots and you can try to double down on certain really foundational teachings here uh, and it'll build one after another uh, to such a great degree for you. So I really pray that you're consistent. Uh, I'm not saying this uh, because I have anything to gain by it, but because I want you to learn. And this is what Elder Athanasios, the great teacher of uh, the modern teacher of Greece, would say again and again in his lectures be here for the sake of the knowledge of the faith. All right. So let's see. The first one is to thank uh, our, our brother here who is. Uh, uh, giving a small donation for the book publishing. Thank you very much. Very kind. Uh, if if you and all and many others gave two dollars every week, uh, it would be hundreds of dollars every week. By the time we got to the end of this book, we would have plenty of money to publish it in a very fine edition. One of the things that we're struggling with as a small publisher is how we can get to the point. We have this massive book that's very expensive to print. We want to get it even better quality. You have a good quality now. We want to even get better quality. But for, for us to do that, was, there's no way uh, on our uh, budget that we could get the quality we want. So your donations and your support is going to go toward uh, a phenomenal, uh, not only finish it and publish it, but it's going to be a, an addition that's going to be something people are going to want to, uh, are going to keep for a long, long time. And it's going to, it's going to, you know, stay the test of time. So thank you very much for that donation. God bless you. Uh, I don't know your first name. I kind of strange saying piston shock mo moto. I'm not sure what the, 
what to call you. If you have a, a, a first name you want to share, go for it so we can get to know you a little bit. Thank you very much for that. Appreciate that. Next uh, that I can see here, let's see. We'll go up to the questions that my coworker has gathered, and that is from D&G Automotive. We've got a lot of auto, auto mechanics here. Question, hello, Father. My husband died suddenly 75 days ago. God, give him rest. God, give him rest and you consolation. I have two young boys. We can see them there in the picture. God bless them. I have regrets about arguments we've had. How do I stop thinking? That's a fantastic question. And thank you for, for, for bringing them. Uh, so there, I don't know who your husband was, which is an Orthodox Christian. I don't know if you're in, in the Orthodox Church, I'm assuming. But in any case, um, we have the pledge and the hope uh, if we are living in Christ and for Christ and repenting, uh, that, of course, we will be together with all of our loved ones again in Christ. Uh, if we're together in Christ here, we'll be together in Christ there. And there is uh, the love of the church for those who depart uh, with, uh, let's say, a lack of love on their part for the, for the truth. Uh, but so first and foremost, we should never, ever, ever despair uh, because Christ has overcome uh, death. And he's given life to all of us who are his disciples. And despair is of the enemy. It's a absolute, un, un, every form of despair, every form of hopelessness, every form uh, of, of extreme anxiety, which brings doubt, is not of God. So you have to see it as your enemy. You have to look at it in the face and say, that is not from God. I want no part of it as opposed to identifying with it. This is what so many people do on so many levels. People have a problem with lust. They've given a lot of rights to the enemy, and they've, they've fallen into many sexual sins. And now they, or, or they're, they've, they've given themselves even to sodomy or other things, and they're identifying with the sin as if it's theirs, as if they are one with sin. Never are we ever one with sin. It's a, it's a parasite. It's a... It's a, it's a uh, uh, an enemy that has inflicted a wound, but it is not us. We should never identify with that. So, so every sin, every falling away from communion, every missing of the mark on all the various levels, and there are many, from very, you know, mortal sins, so 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 called, to very refined things in the in the in the noose in the intellect. There's a whole spectrum of things that want to come between us and God. And so, everything that takes us away from that communion, which despair is again totally and utterly demonic and from the pit of hell, God never wants us to despair ever uh, because he died for us and he is calling us to communion. What do we need to do to have that communion? We need to embrace him, put our trust in him. And then you'll see the more we increase, we ask for the increase of the trust and the more we increase the trust, these things, these thoughts that never stop, these regrets that we had will begin to be uh, diminished will begin to diminish. So whatever happened, whatever words were said, whatever arguments were made, they're no longer. They don't exist any longer. So the, when you live in those thoughts and you live in those memories, you're actually not living in reality. You're not living in reality because there's only one reality right now. It's right now, the reality of right now in, in terms of this world, this time that's given us for repentance. The, the, the anamnesis in Greek or the remembrance of the, the events of salvation are not like this. They're not in that category. Why? Because they're eternal. Because the eternal God brought them about. So all the things of salvation history, all the things that are in Christ, they are not uh, non-existent. Our, our, our people, our friends, our family that are in Christ are not non-existent. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So Whatever happened, repent of it. Whatever happened, and you think that he also had, you know, given rights to the enemy through his arguments, repent for him. Pray for him. Uh, intercede for him. Give alms for him. Uh, and show your love for him now. Through sacrifice, through prayer, through almsgiving, through memorial services. This is how you will uh, commune with God and 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 help him spiritually, help yourself spiritually, rectify spiritually whatever was damage was done. Uh, so focus on that now. What can I do now 
to not do, to not repeat that? What can I do now to bring refreshment through prayer and love for Christ and for my husband? We believe in the Orthodox Church wholeheartedly that the prayers of the church, the prayers out of love for Christ and for our for our brothers and sisters who've gone before us, are never lost. They're never thrown away. They're not pointless. They cannot change those who've departed this life. They they have no ability to repent. Repent means to return, right? They they cannot of themselves return. They they're not. They're no longer whole. Their body and soul has been separated. They can no longer. There is no repentance in Hades, according to Saint John of Damascene. But that doesn't mean that we can't pray, that we can't offer love, that we can't uh, offer almsgiving on their behalf, and that that love will not help them. It will. And the church has shown it again and again that it does. So this, these two things can, can work simultaneously. In other words, the love here can commemorate, can, can be communicated to the love and, and be shared, as it were, through God to those who are departed if they're departed and they were not struggling for righteousness, but they were in the church to a certain degree repenting. There's a cloudiness about, you know, what their status was. I don't know if that's the case with your husband. I'm just saying um, that's where the church doubles down and prays fervently for all of those who left uh, as members of the church, but not zealous, not knowledgeable, um, maybe not prepared. Uh, they weren't preparing themselves. They were negligent. All of that, the church fervently prays for them. So that's what you have. Do what is now available to you, and that is to pray fervently to, to express even now uh, your love through all giving prayer and, and all the rest. Uh, and so hopefully that, bring, that will bring you consolation. There will be no consolation if you live in your head. There will be no consolation if you live in the past. Those are not means to bring about spiritual consolation to your heart and soul. The only way is in Christ, in prayer, and and for the sake and love uh, of Christ and and your husband. Uh, and then you'll give a great example to your children, and how they should live. You should now live uh, doubly for Christ, and for your children, and pray for your husband, uh, knowing how vain and passing this life is, how weak we are, and how quickly we'll depart. This should be a tremendous gift to you spiritually. That sobriety that comes with losing a loved one is a tremendous gift spiritually if we want to uh, make use of it, right? Uh, the anxiety, the, the, prayer, the, the despair, the depression is not, is not going to lead to anything good. So we have to fight against it and we have to trust the Lord. All right, next question. We have... Well, 10 minutes. Is it true, or 12, 15 minutes, is it true there were three trees in Eden, the tree of life, the tree of knowledge, good and real, and the fig tree? No, I don't think so. There were, there was, I've never seen anything that says there's only three, uh, and there no mention of a fig tree that, to my knowledge, but uh, I don't know what you're referring to. You have a scriptural passage uh, that you're referring to? Maybe you can share that if you have it. We can talk about that. Hello, I'm a Roman Catholic. I can't decide between Orthodoxy and Catholicism. Anything I should do, Orthodoxy seems so strong and right, and I feel the same with Catholicism. Well, um, there are various ways to approach this question, uh, and different people to approach it different in different ways. But ultimately, ultimately, we will all arrive uh, at come and see. Right, so there will be many people who will study, 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 study for years, perhaps. They'll look at church history, look at theology, and that's a way that many people have come to orthodoxy because it's the truth is apparent in history. The truth is apparent in the in the events that we're going to be commemorating in two, three weeks in Alabama. The truth is apparent. That's why we're doing it for the sake of you and many others who are searching today because they're looking at the contemporary situation in the world. They're looking at this contemporary pope, and they're saying, "What's going on here?" This is not the apostolic power, truth, way, right? There's a lot of problems. So people are troubled and they're looking and they're examining. And they're, and they're, and they're, so there's one way to, to go about that, to do your research. And perhaps that's what you're inclined to do. Other people say, you know, I, I'm not an academic. I don't research these things. I don't know. I can't deal with 
all these topics. I'm not going to sit down and read a ton of books. So um, they move quickly to the experience, the experience of God. And they go to an Orthodox church. They visit. Uh, I, I didn't know about Orthodoxy much at all, even though my grandfather was from Greece. My mother was raised an Anglican and my father an Anglican priest for 28 years. And then when they all converted uh, and I was at college, I went to the local Greek Orthodox church. Never been an Orthodox church. I don't think ever in my life before that. And um, I walked in a, in a Vesper service and immediately within half an hour, even though it was very simple, very plain, we would say today, if I if I had gone to that today after being a priest for 30 years, or I went to that Vesper service, I would say, oh, okay, whatever, you know, I did. But but God visited my soul on that day and and spoke and said, this is another world. I had been uh, going for about a year and a half to uh, Roman Catholic services. I had many Roman Catholic friends at the time. We were doing pro-life work together. We were sitting in front of abortion clinics. We were trying to help uh, women in crisis pregnancies. I was traveling all around the world, with uh, all around the United States with pro-life leaders at the time very involved on college, college campus. So I had a lot of experience with a lot of very sincere and zealous Roman Catholics and had gone many times to mass. Uh, and so when I walked out of that Vesper service, I closed the door and said, that's another world and I'm back in another world. I mean, it was, it was, I could feel, it, 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 that's what it seemed like to me. I could feel the difference between the spirit in that place and the spirit out on the street. And I had never felt that in Anglicanism or Catholicism. So for me, that was I was Orthodox on the first day. Uh, I had to train my mind, as it were, to follow my heart, and you know I had to read. And but even, that didn't happen. That didn't take long either. So there's different different ways. Different people come to the church, come to the truth. Uh, you have to seek it in prayer. You have to beg God to show you the way, and you have to take steps like in everything in life. That's how it works, right? You do and you pray. You don't just say, God, show me, and then you sit. You don't just go and do and not uh, pray to God and ask his guidance, or you do both. He wants you to do both, and that's how it works. It's a synergy, we say in orthodoxy, working together with God and man. So you have to do both, and you're going to do a little bit of everything probably at the end of the day. But you've got to ultimately go and see. You've got to go and search out the Orthodox Church in a time and space. Because the incarnation happened in Bethlehem, in a particular place, at a particular time, you know, in Jerusalem, the events of, of, of the incarnation and all the rest. The church continues. It is the continuation of the incarnation. And you have to experience Christ in a particular time and place. It's a scandal for the rationalist. He can't get his head around that. He thinks that, well, can't we all just be good? Can't we all just be, you know, you know, even if we're all in the different denominations, can't we all just say we're all in Christ and all this stuff? This is the worldly delusional idea here that does not uh, size up when we look at the words of the Lord and the words of the gospel. I mean, he says to his, his disciples and others, eat my body and drink my blood. That doesn't fit into the rationalist, modernist uh, way of thinking about religions and about, you know, truth and all the rest, right? So you've got to go in time and space to a particular divine liturgy, a particular community, and participate. Now, as a non-Orthodox inquirer, you're going to participate in a very much more limited way, obviously. You're not going to be able to commune, and you may have to leave after the gospel in some places. Uh, but in any case, that's how it starts. And you meet the people, and you talk, and you go, and you, and you have to be patient. And you have to be patient, and you have to go deeper. Now, if you go back and forth on an intellectual level and you're you're not prepared to take the steps i've seen people literally just kind of flounder forever or never become orthodox or never really come to any conclusion in their search because it's not just an intellectual search it's not just an intellectual question it's not just a an analysis of history or analysis of theology. You can, again, see the truth in church history, see the truth in church theology. It's very clear, I think. I think it's, it's, it's going to be very clear in three weeks with this conference that the Pope walked away from the church. The Pope turned his back on the creed. He turned his back on the council that he accepted, the previous Popes accepted. It seems very clear to me that history shows what church is continuing and continued uh, to this day uh, following the fathers of the first millennium. But there are other people who don't see it. And so 
what are they going to do? I'm they continue to search and continue to read, but I think you also have to end up experientially coming and seeing, as the Lord said, come and see. Uh, so a little bit of both, but ultimately that's what's got to happen. Father bless, what do you think the hollow prayer app of the hollow prayer app that they are pushing on YouTube? Never heard of it. Don't know what that is. Don't have it. And as Orthodox Christians, I don't think we need probably too many of these, but um, you know, maybe by next time I can check it out. Maybe, maybe Justin or somebody can show it to me or something and uh, we'll see. But uh, can't comment on it. Don't know it. Father, uh, elaborate, please, uh, on Moses hearing God. I suspect this is a repetition of the pattern of creation. Moses hears God instructing, reading regarding the rod, which separates the words, the waters, to reveal the land. Uh, so the revelation in the Old Testament was the word, the logos. It was speaking and communing and and guiding and appearing uh and so i'm not sure what else what what do you want the elaboration to be on um yes is there something what's the, i don't really understand the question what am i supposed to elaborate on he heard god speak condescend like we said in the in the lecture condescended to the to the forms and to the the which were necessary for him to communicate and guide the righteous and guide his his chosen ones. So they heard the voice. Uh, does that mean that the God has a voice like a human voice? No, but they heard the voice. Uh, they appeared as, uh, uh, you know, the various visions and the various encounters in the Old Testament, the three angels to Abraham. Does that mean that God is 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 has a human and, you know, the, the anthropomorphic, he gets angry. No, all these things are ways of us describing and appearing, is appearing to us and us describing to make sense of it because we, we have our limitations. We cannot make sense of his uh, his his manifest his, his, man, his, his, uh, his work, let's say, his, his way of doing things, which are beyond our capacity to understand. He shows us a certain degree. We understand that and commune with that, but it's through these these forms that that he uh, appears. It's the one and only Lord, the Logos, doing it, but it's in different forms depending on our needs. Is that what you're looking for? I'm not really sure. Dan B., thank you so much. God bless you. God bless you. Michelle Bautista, ba Bautista I think I'm saying, I hope I'm saying it right. Thank you, Michelle. God bless you. God bless everybody who is here tonight and supporting the work. We appreciate it very much. Father bless, I happen to live in a part of the U.S. where the mass immigration is particularly obvious. We've got eight minutes, folks, and then we're going to go to the question and answer session. I hope you can join us. I find the results of this infuriating. How do I handle this appropriately as an Orthodox man? Well, it, it's transparent to everyone that very... Um, sinister forces are at work, uh, not just to destroy the United States, but this has been happening in Europe for 15 years. Uh, in Greece, we have the same phenomenon of, un, you know, tens, hundreds of thousands, if not probably a million, million and a half, I don't know what it's up to, in this little tiny 10 million strong Greece is now from a variety of countries, mostly Pakistan, Iraq, Turkey, other places, and it's intentional. It's absolutely organized and intentional to bring them there and to destabilize and even more easily control the countries they're going to. Uh, it's a. It seems pretty obvious to everybody in Greece. I've never heard anybody say, "Oh, this is," uh, you know, whatever. Now, how should we act? That's your question. Uh, we have. We can't control. Can we? I mean, can we control what they're going to do? It doesn't look like it. We're trying. I mean, people are trying to turn back the tide. God bless them. But it doesn't look like at this point we individually can do much to turn it back. So we've got to deal with it. We've got to deal with it in a way that's going to be spiritually beneficial to us. If we lose our temper, we get angry. Uh, if we uh, if we end up uh, becoming slaves to the passions because of other people's uh, sins and passions, well, that's not going to help anybody. right? So you've got to 
always whatever God allows, you've got to see it as a pedagogical moment to go deeper in your communion with God and to become better spiritually to, to acquire the virtues. So no matter what evil is thrown at us, and if you lead the lives of the saints, there's a lot of evil thrown out the saints. Like we're not suffering at all. Like so, I was telling somebody in a in an interview I did last night, which will come out in a few days. I should probably mention it actually. Um, it's going to come out on Z Media from Australia. I did a two-hour interview about orthodoxy, so that'll come out in a few days. If you guys follow Z Media, I want to uh, go there and check it out if you want to see the interview. Uh, but in any case, I was talking to them last night that you know, comparatively, what what's the big suffering that you know somebody like me is going to suffer? Oh, we're going to have a People are going to call me names. They're going to do ad hominem. Okay, that's going on a long time now. How about they're going to deplatform us or something sometime? Yeah, okay. But if you really look at the lives of the saints and you compare what they suffered, which was unbelievable, um, torture, uh, you know, things that we can't even like fathom because we're so pampered uh, in so many ways, right? So if you just step back and put everything in perspective, I think you'll say, well, it's awful. It's terrible. I recognize the evil. Uh, I have a righteous kind of dis disdain for this sinister thing. I think that's hate sin. I mean, this is a sinful thing that's happening. It's a, it's an intentional destruction of, uh, of of countries, not just the United States. Again, it's all over the world. This is happening for the from the uh, so called first world countries, and there are a variety of reasons for that. But in any case, it's not something that is done by the inspiration of God. So. You can hate that, but you've got to also deal with that God's allowing it. And there's some something we need to learn, something we need to do in response that's going to help us to come closer to Christ. I mean, this life is very short. We might die tomorrow night. Are we gonna are we gonna spend all of our energy on temporal uh machinations and not uh, and waste our time? I mean, the devil would love for us to waste our lives uh on things that have no bearing in eternity and uh, uh so we've got to keep it all in perspective it doesn't mean that these things aren't important we shouldn't struggle for for righteousness and for and for justice i don't mean that at all i i wholeheartedly support people who for instance go and sit in front of abortion clinics like like i did 40 30 years ago as a college student i mean helping people not kill their babies is a wonderful thing uh but uh all kinds of actions like that, you know, that are good for society and all that. It's not, it's, those are good things, but you have to put them in a greater perspective. That's what a lot of people miss. Like, okay, that's not the essence of the spiritual life. It's not the essence of our life in Christ. We've got to see that as a part, but people make it the whole. So, so whatever is coming at you, whatever you're involved in a, on a horizontal plane, so to speak, remember all of that is passing and temporal and all of that is a means to loving christ yes but there's there's a direct ascent that needs to happen like you need you and i need to ascend to uh, as much as we can up the ladder of uh, of communion with god and the virtues and so we're always we're always you know every day we wake up and say okay now i'm gonna have this challenge how am i gonna handle it am i gonna handle it prayerfully am i gonna am i gonna use it like the devil is constantly always trying to destroy us, but God, if we, if for those who are faithful, the apostle Paul says, everything works for good. How does it work for good? Because they transform that. The devil brings it and they think, oh, he's going to destroy me. or And it turns out being for the benefit. For, but how does that happen? Through our humility, through our uh, long suffering, our, our prayer. That's how those things become transformed and, and salvific. So it's in our hands to not be irate, angry for no reason but to transform everything that's coming at us and make it salvific and you'll help everybody including yourself when you do that probably won't have help many if we sit and and, and grit our teeth and and scream at the television or whatever it is right that's not going to help it's not going to help many people so let's be smart and let's realize what's going on and god's allowing it he's allowing the, he's going to allow a lot of things that we're going to say god have mercy just now today i was told before we went live in Greece, the parliament, I guess, passed the bill that will allow for same-sex recognition by the state of marriages for same-sex couples. That's un unbelievable for Greek people, I guarantee you. If all the faithful in Greece are just scratching their going, what happened to us? What? How did we arrive at this insanity? Nobody would have thought that that was going to happen 15 years ago, let alone 30, 50, 100. 
God's allowing it because of our apostasy, our our own you know, collectively, right? Our our sinfulness, our worldliness, and I mean our meaning all the people, all the people, the church people, the bishops, the priests, everybody. Like we're collectively co-responsible for all of that. Our spiritual, you know, ineptitude and 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 weakness allows for the devil and his workers to get in there and do their and do their thing. We don't, we're indifferent to truth. We're indifferent to. We don't want to sacrifice for the sake of the truth. So so now that that's happened, what are we going to do? What we're going to do. We're going to angry and scream and yell. Greece is now apostate and Orthodox Greece is dead or whatever. I mean, we could could do that. I, mean, I don't see the. It's not going to be really profitable. So what are we going to do? We have to save ourselves. In other words, unite ourselves to God and become virtuous in the midst of all this, in the midst of all this, and be smart about it. Right? Be smart about it. All right, we only got, well, we're done, actually, uh, unfortunately. I went on and on. Um, there's a lot more questions. Let me just recognize Justin. Thank you very much. Gifted five Orthodox memberships, Orthodox Eagles memberships to some of you tonight. I think it automatically goes out. Vasily, welcome. God bless you. Uh, and everybody else who has questions here, David, uh, I'm not going to be able to get to them right here. Let's see if we can get those. I don't know. Justin, can you get those written out? We can bring them over there and answer them in the question and answer session. Uh, thank you very much, Kurt and Stephen. Uh, but we got to end this. This is the schedule we have. Uh, you can come back on, on Tuesday. You can come back on next Thursday and ask them again if we can't get to your questions tonight. Uh, and uh, God bless you. We got to run over to the other platform. All of you who want to join us for the for the question answer session, the hour and a half question answer session on these platforms here, uh, you um, can look under the description of this live stream right now. Should be on most platforms. There should be a description, and there's a link to the YouTube, Instagram. Well, I don't know. Instagram doesn't have a link, but YouTube, Patreon, and Orthodox Ethos. Uh, you can see the link uh, and go, and join join us uh, either on the YouTube or the uh, or these other platforms that that you all are watching us. Uh, in about eight minutes, we're going to start the uh, live question and answer session. Thank you much very much for joining us. God bless you, uh, and we will see you uh, very soon. God bless. <laughs> Thank you.